Okay, so today I'll be talking about uh, intergenerational inequality and the intergenerational state, which is a paper that I'm working on with uh, Jeremy Temple and Peter McDonald. Um, here's an outline of what I'm going to be talking about today. <clears throat> so first I'll give a short introduction. I'll talk briefly about the data source that the paper is based on, which is the Australian National Transfer Accounts. Then I'll go through some results on income and public transfers, introduce an index of intergenerational inequality in income, and then talk a bit about the redistribute effect of public transfers. Talk about trends and then have a few concluding remarks. So, the introduction. Uh, so intergenerational inequality, of course, is a, um, is a topic that's of concern to many in society. And uh, you know, experts and the general population have uh, various views on the extent and the justification for intergenerational inequality. I'm going to talk a little bit about some results from uh, Hal Kendig, Hussein Ololan and Cannon from 2008, who uh, looked at attitudes to intergenerational inequality based on the National Survey of Australian Attitudes to Intergenerational Inequality. Their findings were looking at the question of uh well one question was each generation has different social and economic opportunities over their lives how would you say though the lifelong opportunities for baby boomers compared to those for younger people today uh now the main finding was that for almost uh, well for most the most common answer 49 percent of people thought that uh baby boomers had better lifelong opportunities than younger people. Another question compared the opportunities for baby boomers compared to older people who have already retired. And the main finding there was that also close to a majority of people felt that the baby boomers had uh, more lifelong opportunities than people who had already retired. So the, the general view is that baby boomers are a privileged generation who have had better lifelong opportunities than uh, earlier generations and also later generations. And one final question I'll talk about is, do you think older people are getting more than their fair share, less than their fair share or about, the, or about their, fa their fair share of government benefits? And the majority of people thought that older people were getting less than their fair share. So that just paints a picture of general attitudes towards uh, intergenerational inequality as they exist in uh, the general populace in Australia. Now, there have been various measures. Uh, um, well, I'll talk a little bit about this uh, but, uh, Taxonomy of Indicators of Economic Sustainability and Intergenerational Fairness, developed by Gal and Mona Story. So there have been various measures of uh, economic sustainability and intergenerational fairness, and Gal and Mona Story have uh, uh, put them within a taxonomy, which has a number of different dimensions. So on the, on the, uh, so the different rows in this uh, table uh, relate to how to how expansive the uh, the uh, the focus of the inequality or the measure is. So if they can focus on specific public programs, or they can look at general government, or they can expand be expanded to look at the whole market economy, or they can be expanded even further to look at the total economy, which here uh, is basically the market economy plus uh, the household economy. So that's one dimension. Um, the next dimension, uh, which they call cross, the cross-sectional cross versus long-time horizon. So that's the distinction between looking at, say, a, the inequality in a cross-section at a specific point in time, or looking at uh, uh, economic sustainability or fairness, um, yes, across a longer time period, I guess. And I'm going to focus on the longer time period. Within that, uh, within that, uh, within measures that focus on longer time periods, they make a distinction between cohort and population measures. So cohort measures just 
they follow essentially one specific cohort and population measures look at uh, 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 the whole population over a longer time period. So within, the, within this table, there are a number of different indicators of economic sustainability and intergenerational fairness. And actually, most of these measures that have been developed relate to economic sustainability, which is, um, yeah, how, I guess, how sustainable um, transfer systems between generations are in, um, into the future. Now, there is a distinction between economic sustainability and intergenerational fairness. Um, yeah, sustainability looks at uh, what, uh, well, I guess sustainability and intergenerational fairness looks at whether the distribution is uh, equitable. Uh, so I'm going to point out one particular cell, which is the, uh, if you look at the uh, market economy row and uh, the long time horizon focusing on the whole population, there is one measure there called the consumption deficit. Now that is a measure of economic sustainability. Uh, there is actually no developed measure of intergenerational fairness for that focuses on the total market economy and the total population over a longer time period. Now in earlier work, uh, uh, me, and my, me and Jeremy and Peter have talked about two temporal perspectives on material living standards and intergenerational inequality, which uh, more or less correspond to uh, Gal and Montessori's distinction between cross-sectional and long-term horizon. So the first perspective is the cross-sectional perspective, which focuses on material living standards at a particular point in time and how these living standards vary between people of different ages. So for example, uh, what is the income of young people compared to older people in 2020? So the second perspective is the cohort perspective, which focuses on material living standards over a lifetime and how these living standards vary between people of different generations or birth cohorts. So it would be looking at uh, how the, inc the uh, incomes over a lifetime of uh, uh, baby boomers compares to other generations, for example. Okay, now I'll talk a little bit about the data source on which this uh, paper is based. Or I should say, well, so in this paper, we're going to focus on the cohort perspective, but I'll talk a little bit about the cross-sectional perspective. So the data source is the national transfer accounts, um, which have been described as a system of macroeconomic accounts that measure current economic flows by age in a manner consistent with the UN system of national accounts. NTA measure age specific labor income, asset income, consumption, transfers and saving, accounting flows within households, between households, through the public sector and the rest of the world. So it's basically an accounting system that looks at uh, economic flows between ages across the in all sectors of the economy. It focuses on particularly on individual residents within a particular country. It uh, recognizes three institutional sectors, the public sector, the private sector, and the rest of the world. And within the national transfer accounts, institutions are considered to be agents of individuals or intermediaries between individuals. So for example, um, the welfare state is considered to be an intermediary between taxpayers and welfare benefit recipients, for example. Um, or companies are, say if a company pays a tax, it's considered to be an intermediary between uh, the owners of the company and, uh, and the state, and through them people who benefit from the state. So institutions are just intermediaries between individuals. Uh, the Australian NTA was developed based on methods uh, put together by the Global NTA Project, and it uses a whole uh, swathe of data sources, the Australian System of National Accounts and the uh, ABS Household Expenditure Surveys are the main ones, but there are a range of other sources. The whole accounts uh, include 67 detailed account items. They're essentially three broad 
accounts, life cycle deficit account, which looks at consumption and labor income, and then um, two age-related reallocation accounts that um, relate to uh, transfers and asset-based reallocations. Asset-based asset reallocations are inter-age transfers that uh, operate through the through assets. So, for example, saving, dissaving, or um, capital income. And the, there are there's a public sector account and a private sector account. And as uh, Peter said earlier, uh, we've constructed NTA for six years over a 28 year time period from 1981, 82 to 2019. And we're hoping to do uh, uh, one for 2015, 16. So from the, from the 67 detailed account items, for this paper, I constructed three variables. The first is net public transfers, which is uh, public transfer inflows. So transfers from the public sector to households from, uh, um, yeah, that are received by households, uh, minus public transfer outflows. So that's uh, economic flows that go from the public, from the, uh, from the households to the public sector. So the first variable is net public transfers. Um, I, maybe I should say that in, this includes public transfer inflows, includes um, all, ex, all expenditure of the public sector. So it includes welfare, state benefits, um, uh, but it also includes uh, public transfers provided in kind like uh, uh, public health care, Medicare, uh, public education, and it also includes uh, um, public you know, more public transfers that are collective goods like defense. Uh, and there are different 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 uh, methods used in the uh, the global NTA project has developed different methods for allocating these to individuals. So that's net public transfers. The next variable is, uh, oh, uh, I should say, public transfer outflows includes uh, uh, income taxes, but also um, uh, taxes on uh, imports and production, like uh, the GST, for example. Okay, so pre-public transfer income is basically all income apart from net public transfers. So it includes labor income, capital income, property income, received net of property income paid, and private transfers received net of public tra uh, private transfers paid. Right. And the final variable is post-public transfer income, which is basically pre-public transfer income plus net public transfer income. It's total income. Okay, so having constructed those three variables, I'm just going to describe now some of the results from that you get from the NTA. So first I'm going to look at the uh, results from a cross-sectional perspective. So this graph uh, describes per capita pre-public transfer income by age for the six years for which we calculated data. Um, I guess the main, uh, the main point, the main thing you can see from this graph is that uh, pre-public transfer income varies by age, slow for the younger age groups, higher for prime working ages, and lower for older ages, and it has generally increased over time. Now, this is the graph for uh, cross-sectional per capita net public transfers by age. And uh, you can see from this, you know, for the six years for which we have data, and you can see that, uh, generally speaking, um, net public transfers are positive for people at younger ages. Essentially, they receive more public transfers than they pay. Um, people at the prime working ages uh, pay more than they receive in public transfers, so public transfers are negative. And then for older ages, um, older ages are net recipients of public transfers. Uh, 
one thing to point out is that uh, you can see from this graph that in, in per capita amounts, uh, older ages tend to receive the largest amounts of net public transfers. Now, this has led some people from this cross-sectional perspective to describe uh, the welfare state as uh, being biased towards older people. So yes, so the welfare state has been described on the basis of this, this kind of cross-sectional pattern as a, as a, yeah, being biased towards, towards older people. Another thing to note is that over time, um, if you focus at the younger ages, over time, um, the uh, amount of uh, net public transfer is received by uh, younger people has increased over time. If you focus at older people, also the uh, the uh, net public transfer is received by older people have has increased over time. And if you focus at the prime working ages, then the amount of public transfer is paid by prime working age people has also increased. I should should have mentioned these are all mentioned these have all been standardized to two thousand nine ten dollars. So this is the graph, the cross-sectional graph for post public transfer income by age per capita. And uh, I guess you can see that generally speaking, uh, the general trend of uh, post public transfer income or total income is that it, it uh, increases with age. Um, and the, the main point is that uh, um, post public transfer income has increased for all age groups over time. Uh, generally speaking, yeah, total income has been increasing over time. So this is, uh, so we've looked at uh, the NTA results for these variables uh, from a cross-sectional perspective. So if we, we can also, because we, because we have uh, done the NTA for multiple years, we can create synthetic birth cohorts and uh, look at uh, how the experience of different birth cohorts have evolved over time. So in the next few graphs, I'm going to be focusing on, well, I'm grouping the birth cohorts into generations and uh, talking about uh, five different generations using labels that other people have used, the greatest generation, silent generation, baby boomers, generation X and millennials. So this is the graph, uh, the per capita pre-public transfer income by birth cohort graph um, from a cohort perspective. Um, I mean, one thing that you do notice is that in terms of pre-public transfer income, generally speaking, the later birth cohorts have had received more pre-public transfer income than earlier birth cohorts at the same age. So for example, um, you know, comparing, you compare the, the solid green line and the dashed orange line. Solid green line is baby boomers born in 1955. The uh, dashed green, dashed orange, so that was the, the solid green line. The dashed orange line is the silent generation members born in 1945. And you can see at age 45, the uh, baby boomers were receiving more pre-public transfer income than the silent generation. And generally speaking, uh, older generations receive more income than younger generations at the same age. This is uh, the uh, cohort graph for net public transfers. And uh, for the years that we have uh, available. And you can basically see what was identified earlier, which is that at younger ages, the later birth cohorts receive more public transfers than earlier birth cohorts. The same can be said for older ages and for the prime working ages. Generally speaking, the later birth cohorts pay more in public transfers than um, the earlier birth cohorts. Okay. This is a, 
This is the per capita post-public transfer income by birth cohort graph. And uh, so this is total income, the total income received by different birth cohorts as they've aged over time. And here, uh, the pattern where older, er, older birth, uh, later birth cohorts receive more income than earlier birth cohorts is uh, pretty constant and uh, clearer than for the pre-public transfer um, graph. Yeah, so essentially you can say that, yeah, in terms of total income, post-public transfer income, uh, later birth cohorts have received more income than earlier birth cohorts. So this suggests that there is some level of um, uh, inequality between generations in terms of income. But to, uh, you know, here, we pre here we're presenting it for a, you know, a handful of different generations. If you wanted to measure total, the total level of uh, intergenerational inequality in income from a cohort perspective, uh, you need to, to develop an index that uh, takes into account uh, not only these handful of cohorts, but uh, all cohorts over the entire time period for which you have data. Uh, so I'm going to talk about the uh, I'm going to talk about the index of intergenerational inequality income that uh, we come up with, which uh, we call the I index. Um, now the aim of this index is to measure the extent of inequality in the living standard experienced by people of different generations of birth cohorts over their lifetimes. Um, now, the problem with uh, trying to uh, measure the extent of inequality in living standards over people's lifetimes is that we generally don't have information on the uh, incomes that people receive over their entire lifetimes. So, the approach uh, we have taken is to essentially try to estimate lifetime income on the basis of the income that we do have. And in this case, it's income over um, a 28 year time period. So we do make a number of assumptions. Um, inequalities between birth cohorts over their lifetimes are approximated by inequalities across the limited number of years for which, in, for which information is available. More specifically, inequality between birth cohorts over their lifetimes are assumed to be approximated by inequalities between birth cohorts when these birth cohorts are at the same ages across the limited number of years for which information is available. So, so for example, in this uh, in this graph, we're trying to estimate the inequality between in lifetime incomes between these different generations using the information that is available. So if you compare the uh, what was that? Um, so. Um, so, for example, if you're comparing the solid green line with the dashed, yellow, dashed orange line, that's comparing a specific, specific birth, birth cohort of baby boomers with a specific birth cohort of the silent generation. We basically compare the, compare the, we make a comparison from when these birth cohorts were at when they were a, between ages roughly 35 and 55, for which we have data. Okay. Okay, so in order to uh, generate this index of intergenerational inequality, our starting point is, point is a two-way table of mean income by age and birth cohort. Now the first, that is the earliest birth cohort, and the second, that is the second earliest birth cohort, can be compared by calculating for each age for which data is available for both, for both birth cohorts, the ratio of the, the 
second birth cohort's mean income to the first birth cohort's mean income. So for the, yeah. Now the mean of these ratios across all the ages for which data is available for both birth cohorts is an indicator of the second birth cohort's income expressed as a proportion of the first birth cohort's income. So we essentially take for the years of which the two birth cohorts um, for which we have income on, for the ages for which we have income data for both birth cohorts, at each age we calculate the ratio of those two incomes, then we calculate the mean of those ratios across all of the years, the ages for which we have data for both birth cohorts. Now that mean is an indicator that is assumed to approximate the inequality between these two birth cohorts over their lifetimes. So that now, so that's comparing the first and the second birth cohorts. The second and the third birth cohort can be compared in the same way, as can all later pairs of birth cohorts, leading to a series of indicators of one birth cohort's income expressed as a proportion of the preceding birth cohort's income. Now, by chaining together the series of indicators, it's possible to calculate a related series of indicators, which we've called L1, L2, L3. L1 is the L indicator for the first birth cohort, L2 is the indicator for the second birth cohort, and so on, in which the incomes of all birth cohorts are expressed as a proportion of the income of the first birth cohort. So this series of indicators is assumed to approximate the inequalities between these birth cohorts over their lifetimes. Now the index of intergenerational inequality is estimated by calculating the Gini coefficient across this series of L indicators. Now we use the Gini coefficient because it has, it has a number of, of course, the Gini coefficient is the most commonly used index of inequality for good reasons. Firstly, it's intuitively meaningful. It's uh, the Gini coefficient is a function of the, if you compare the incomes of all possible pairs of people across the entire population, so if you compare one person with everyone else and the second person with everyone else, if you compare all of those uh, income differences and you calculate the mean of those income differences, the Gini coefficient is a function of that mean. So it's intuitively meaningful. Uh, secondly, it also obeys the principle of transfers or also called the Pigou Dalton condition, which is that if you take income away from a richer person and give it to a any person who is less rich, that will decrease inequality as measured by the index. It's also scale invariant, which means that um, doesn't matter if income is measured in um, income uh, in uh, dollars or cents, or if you multiply income by a certain amount, it does not change. If you multiply income, all incomes by a certain amount, it doesn't change the, the uh, Gini coefficient. And the Gini coefficient, uh, generally speaking, uh, in, in most conditions, varies between zero and one. So zero is absolute equality, where everyone has the same income and one is where all income is received by one person. About five minutes, James, not the most. Oh. Oh, okay. Um, so I should say that in terms of Gal and Montessori's taxonomy of indicators of economic sustainability and generational fairness, this index of, in of inequality fits in in the same cell where the consumption deficit fill, uh, fits in. So if we uh, so with this inequality measure, we would now have a, for looking at the entire market economy and the population over a long-term horizon, we would have not only a index of economic sustainability, but also one of intergenerational fairness. Okay, so this is a graph of um, the L indicators for different birth cohorts, all expressed as a, is for proportion of the L indicator for uh, birth, co uh, birth cohorts born in 1915. Uh, so you can generally see that uh, um, the L indicator, which we assume is an indicator of lifetime 
income has uh, generally increased over time, uh, it has uh, increased such that later birth cohorts have more lifetime income than earlier birth cohorts. And uh, the differences are quite uh, remarkable. So for example, um, for example, uh, the middle year of baby boomers um, has about almost twice as much lifetime income as a uh, generation born in 1915, whereas millennials born in 1995 have roughly almost four and a half times as much lifetime income as those born in 1915. Uh, you can also say that uh, millennials on average have about uh, a little over double the lifetime income that um, baby boomers have on average. Now, if you calculate the Gini coefficient over this uh, distribution, which is the I index for post product transfer income, it comes to about 0.345. And uh, that's quite high compared to some other Gini coefficients. So for the Gini coefficient for equivalent disposable household income, 2009-10 was 0.32. And uh, the, Gini coefficient, the Gini coefficient for final household income, which is disposable income plus social transfers in kind minus taxes on production is uh, 0.252. So compared to these other Gini coefficients, this I index is, you can say that intergenerational inequality, well, it's high. Yeah, it's like, okay, I'll talk quickly about the redistributive effect of public transfers. Now, there is a long tradition of research that looks at the redistributive effect of public transfers by comparing inequality in post-public transfer income with inequality in pre-public transfer income. So you can think of the redistributive effect of public transfers on intergenerational inequality income is to look at the I index for post-public transfer income the, and uh, subtract the I index for pre-public transfer income. Now, when you calculate those things, the I index for post-public transfer income, as mentioned, is 0.345, and that for pre-public transfer income is 0.311, which means that the redistributive effect um, of public transfers is positive, which means that uh, public transfers have worked to in in increase intergenerational inequality in income. Okay, um, trends. I'll talk quickly about this. Um, uh, this is so instead of calculating uh, the I index over the full 28 year time period, this graph presents the I index calculated over a decade at uh, succeeding decades over this 28 year time period. So it calculates the I index for pre and post public transfer income and for the redistribute effect. And you can see there is some variation. Uh, pre, uh, the, the redistribute effect is uh, fairly constant. It's always it's always uh, positive. And I will just say that, that the variation that you see has to do with um, variation in economic growth. So whether or not the, the time period looked at includes the recessions of the early uh, 1980s and early 1990s, or the uh, global financial crisis or whether it's included uh, the mining boom. So those have, aff have affected uh, intergenerational inequality in income as um, uh, measured by the I index. Okay, I'll just go through my concluding remarks. So in this paper, we develop a new measure of intergenerational inequality in income, the I index, which shows that intergenerational inequality in income is substantial. Uh, generally, earlier generations receive less income than later generations, which is contrary to some of those popularly held um, attitudes to intergenerational inequality we talked about at the beginning of the paper, um, which is that baby boomers did the best. Um, basically, we show that in terms of uh, income, uh, baby boomers have done uh, better than uh, earlier generations, but worse than later generations. Uh, and we've also shown that public transfers work to increase intergenerational inequality in, in income. So from this cohort perspective, we could say that the welfare state is biased towards later generations, which is uh, as distinct from the cross-sectional uh, 
claim that the, the welfare state is biased towards older people. We could say that uh, in terms of, uh, from a cohort perspective, that the uh, welfare state is, has a bias towards later generations. Of course, those aren't necessarily in conflict. They're just two different uh, pers uh, perspectives on the welfare state. Now, for future work, um, uh, we've just looked at income, average income over a lifetime in a specific in per year, essentially. Uh, you can, of course, but later generations, you could look instead of instead of uh, income at, per year, you could look at total lifetime income over entire lifetimes, which would be affected by uh, ev evolutions in longevity. And of course, uh, younger generations have generally uh, lived longer than earlier generations. So in you could incorporate uh, intergenerational differences in longevity, which could be expected to exacerbate uh, intergenerational inequalities in income measured over a lifetime. Uh, so we may also in the future uh, look at what makes the greatest contribution to intergenerational inequality in, in income. Uh, we've looked a bit at uh, public transfers, but you could actually decompose the I index by income source. So labor income, capital income, all those different income sources and see which, what if different effects they have had at, uh, on intergenerational inequality. And uh, we also are working on a paper which looks at, is there a trade-off between intergenerational inequality income as measured by the I index and the financial sustainability of intergenerational transfer systems, which we measure using the consumption deficit uh, mentioned earlier. So yeah, we analyze the relationship between the I-index and indicators of financial sustainability. So we're working on that paper at the moment. So, um, so that's uh, my that's what we're working on. <laughs>